Um, hi, everyone. I am Sophie, and um, I'm here to talk to you about the power of stories, but actually about the power of one particular story that um, I love and you all love. It's Sesame Street. Um, and everyone loves the Cookie Monster and Elmo and Big Bird. Uh, we all remember them a lot. Um, but what people don't know necessarily about Sesame Street is that it did more for the literacy and numeracy of poor African Americans in America than any other preschool initiative at that, that time. And like at the fraction of the cost, I think it was about $7,000 per year for a kid to attend preschool and $5 a year for a kid to watch Sesame Street with the same educational outcomes. So I think it's amazing. And it came about because it was like 1969 and um, there were race riots and the civil rights movement was gaining momentum. And it was at a time when usually African-American people were on TV as entertainers or servants. And some very smart people got together and they were like, oh, everyone's really addicted to you know, like this TV thing. Maybe we can harness that and use that for good. Um, and they did, they were really effective. So uh, I love Sesame Street. And if this, um, if this story is making you feel sexy and you want to go home and um, make a baby, just imagine that you did that. And then fast forward, <laughs> and it's 2050. <laughs> and um, now your child is 23 years old. Um, and uh, she's just entered the work world, and 50% of the jobs that we know of today are now automated. They're done by robots. Maybe she's got a, a neuroprosthetic, which means that she doesn't even need to move to um, direct the devices in her life. And that brings a whole new meaning to sort of cybersecurity. Um, so yeah, she might need digital skills to stay ahead. Um, or, uh, and I know this makes everyone very uncomfortable, but like given the state of the world at the moment and the political instability and the fact that population is growing and we don't have enough like water um, or food and we're like consuming ourselves into the ground, like maybe she'll just be foraging for food. So my main point <laughs> is that um, like no one knows, the future is very uncertain um, more than ever before. <laughs> so how can we prepare our children for the future? Um, well, I believe that um, kids need digital skills um, and that they are as fundamentally important as reading or writing is. Um, without digital skills, how can you understand a world that's digital? And if digital worlds are built on code, you need to understand coding to understand that world. Um, and employers think so too. That's why coders now get paid more than, you know, like doctors and uh, you know, other well paid or whoever's bankers. Um, and it's the most sought after skill uh, um, in the world. By 2020, we need 2.3 million digital workers. So it's really important and your kids need to know it. They don't just need to code, they need to be able to think. They need to be able to think critically <laughs> and they need to be creative and they need to have empathy. Because if we have um, kids with skills or tools, but they don't know how to think for themselves and they can't create and they don't care about other people, um, then I think that we're headed for disaster and they're robots anyway. It's just that the other robots will be faster than them. So, <laughs> um, like, where are they going to learn these digital skills? Uh, will they learn it at school? Like, uh, yeah, maybe. Um, in, <laughs> in 2014, in England, we introduced the computer science curriculum and I helped to do that with the Department for Education and Code Club, so it's compulsory. And five-year-olds are learning to code, um, and they're learning maths and English, which is great. But uh, teachers feel unprepared, and like, it takes ages to make big changes in schools and in systems. And I think that a lot of people feel alienated by coding. They sort of think, oh, that's for like a spotty teenager in a dark room somewhere. Um, and it doesn't feel very accessible. And the proof of that is that the tech industry has like, got terrible diversity statistics. I think. 18% of the workforce are female or comprised of other underrepresented groups, um, and less females take computer science now than they did 10 years ago, which is crazy. Um, so there's a real issue. If they're not learning it at school, like where else are they going to learn it? Um, where else do kids hang out? Uh, Ofcom have just released a report to say that kids spend up to six hours each day in front of their screens. So they are learning a lot from their media, which is great, just like Sesame Street, they're sort of addicted and it could be an opportunity for a solution. But um, I believe that uh, that's one of the problems is the sort of conditioning that's going on in the mainstream media today. So they're spending six hours in front of this media and it's sort of warping their view of the world. Um, 
And the reason why girls don't think or don't become coders is because they don't think that they can be coders. And they don't think they can be coders because they never see any coders that look like them, like in the real world or in fictional worlds. Um, so if you're ever bored, you can just Google like any profession and you'll see what the world thinks of that profession. So this is what a boss looks like. This is what an assistant looks like. This is what a scientist looks like. And this is what a developer looks like or a coder. Um, and I go into schools and like, talk to kids a lot. And I ask them, what percentage of people in the world do you think have white Caucasian skin? Is it 15%, 44%, or 73%? And nine times out of 10, all kids think it's either 44% or 73%. Um, and you know, it's nuts, because it's 15% of people in the world that have white Caucasian skin. And actually, we've done a survey of 1,000 parents across the UK, not parents, adults, and they have the same sort of perception. Um, and then when you look at cartoons globally, and you think, well, what percent of cartoons, not just in the UK, but across the world, have uh, white skin, and it's 72%, so three quarters. So we're sort of um, showing kids that the world is full of white people. You know, men are twice as likely to take the lead as females in cartoons. 90% of girls are underweight, but like, you know, like medically underweight, and Batman never recycles, and so, like... <laughs> <laughs> It's really bad. <laughs> um, we are, yeah, we're showing them that if you're a white male, you're visible and you're more important. Um, and yeah, I go, I go into schools quite a bit and I see that the impact that this has on kids. And um, I, was, I used to teach in a school in inner city London and none of my kids, half of whom were girls and about 80% were black or Asian kids, they never thought of themselves as the leaders of tomorrow or the engineers or the coders because they never saw themselves in those stories. Um, and so uh, then I was like, oh, well, there's an opportunity here. Technology can be used, you know, you can make a game out of everything. So let's make better stories. We need a media revolution. And um, that is the emoji for revolution. Who knew that Apple had slipped that in? Um, that black and white one. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I decided that we could do something about this. And um, so I created a character called Detective Dot. She is a nine-year-old uh, coder, she loves Minecraft, and she uses tech um, on her big global adventures. And her sidekick is a drone that she built herself. Um, and she can program the drone to sense sounds and movements, and the drone is an excellent spy companion, unless it is running out of battery, or worst of all, can't get a signal, and then it gets very passive aggressive. Um, <laughs> her best friend <laughs> is called Tumble, and Tumble is very vain and takes selfies of um, himself all of the time, but um, sometimes in the back of the selfies they capture clues. Do not trust Shelly Belly. She will try and sell you stuff, but her terms and conditions are very onerous, and she actually wants all of your data because she's really after global mind control. Um, Dot is part of a top secret uh, spy organization called the Children's Intelligence Agency, also known as the CIA. Um, <laughs> you are all too old to join, but the CIA um, investigates really interesting sort of mysteries and global injustices like homework crimes, um, the global, <laughs> the, I think, yeah, the global poo crisis, which is like, why are all these adults just wasting this liquid gold when it could be used as sustainable energy um, and other stuff? <laughs> um, and so, through the CIA, the CIA has got really cool gadgets. So, um, they've hacked a selfie stick, and if it gets into enemy hands, it releases a mega fart and it knocks everyone out for five minutes. <laughs> and <laughs> that allows us to show kids that coding can be really fun and we can show them authentication codes and sort of debugging and they can tinker about with the features, so they might want a distracting burp for like a less dangerous situation. Um, the other thing that the CIA is looking into at the moment is uh, media and representation. So we've got a study going on across the country where kids are extracting the data from their stories, stories in their classroom or from the best-selling books last year or from movies, and looking at representation. And like, you get really interesting discussion coming out of that. So. Um, I, I don't know if you've all had a chance to read it, but there are no books about f people like my friend Kayla. One um, young girl wondered if everyone who works at Disney was white. We had a seven-year-old boy who said that he didn't think it was fair that men always have to be leaders and be strong because it puts a lot of pressure on him. And he doesn't always want to be a strong leader, <laughs> just sometimes. <laughs> um, and so the critical thinking piece is so important. And actually, the CIA's motto is question everything. So getting kids to sort of question the world around them and the systems that they're in, um, otherwise the robots will win. Um, 
And yeah, it's going really well. We've, you know, like kids are really engaging with it. We get um, agents writing into us all the time. They take their identity very seriously. As you can see, we have no idea who this is from. <laughs> it's from 001580. Um, and we have agents in 30 countries across the world, and we're launching in 20,000 schools. So the story um, has really engaged kids across the world. So finally. Um, I want everyone to think about where does learning happen? You know, it doesn't happen between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. And when the bell goes, kids are like, well, that's it, I've stopped learning. Um, they learn all of the time. And so we really need to use the power of our stories wisely um, to train kids to be prepared for the future and all kids, not just some kids. Um, so, like, imagine a world where Superman did recycle and, like, Gotham City was powered by solar energy and Barbie was a white hat hacker? Or like, what if you got the soul of Sesame Street and you combined it with the reach of Minecraft and the sort of interactive scalability of Pokemon Go? What sort of effect would that have on kids? Um, and finally, um, in the words of the great philosopher Whitney Houston, <laughs> I believe that children are the future. <laughs> Teach them well and let them lead the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>